So that escalated quickly. This engine has come out of this bike that was originally only here for a valve clearance check. It had a dyno run that shoot it had a drop in horsepower. So it got booked in to check the valve clearances before we checked the cylinder leakage or a compression test. So what we found was once they were set correctly, it still had cylinder leakage. So it had some sort of issue internally with the head that was causing it to drop power. With the leakage test, we could see it was leaking through the exhaust valves. Anyway, this video is supposed to be about how to shoot a reel or a TikTok. So let's go back to the start before I knew it had some head issues. So for anyone who's watching this video before they've seen any of my short form videos, I produce a video a day of around a minute, minute and a half, and I upload them to everywhere, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. You can upload the same video. And um, recently they've done quite well. I guess it's been more businesses that have asked me how I film these videos rather than individuals. They are fantastic advertisement, just getting your name out there is just fantastic from the videos, but do realize that it's not a quick process. It takes a long time for it to build up. It starts out very slowly. Nobody watches your first 100 videos you make, and you do have to commit quite a bit of time to them. I quite enjoy making them, so for me, it's not that much of a pain. But the main thing that you've probably noticed is you have to keep them interesting and just to keep the actual frame changing quite regularly. So I usually show a clip for no more than two seconds at a time and then switch to the other clip. Sometimes that means that I am cutting between clips on the same video. So I'll have it static for you know a minute and I'll show three or four different sections within that minute long clip but only take you know a second at a time of each one. That works out nicely. It makes the videos flow quite quickly. So there's not really much more to say about how they're filmed. I usually start out with what people with class as an establishing shot so like a wider thing just so people can get a bit of an idea of what's going on but that doesn't need to be more than two seconds long and the other thing is when you're filming something just get on with it there's no point people are only watching for you know a minute and they decide in the first couple of seconds if they're going to watch it so just get on with it no dilly dallying no faffing around no showing stuff that don't need to be in there or talking about stuff that isn't important just get on with it so one thing I always do before a film is I have a general idea of what I'm going to say in the video, what the video is going to be about. So rather than just having a video of you doing something, I feel like you've always got to give away a bit of knowledge or a bit of information, just let people learn something. I think that's because I've realized that people don't actually care about me. Like the video is not about me at all. The videos are about learning something about bikes. And you've got to realize that when you make a video, Nobody really cares or gives a shit about you. I think people only really watch a video for two reasons. One of them is entertainment, the other is education. I'm definitely not really in the entertainment industry, so uh, I think if I can teach people something and they learn something, then everyone gets something out of it. Talking of giving away information, something that's really common on sports bikes is for people to fit quick shifters. And what they do is it puts a break in between the ignition side of things. So there is a plug on either end of the coil. So all a quick shifter does is when you hit the gear lever, it momentarily cuts the ignition, which means there's no load on the engine so the gear can just slot in without you having to pull the clutch or letting go of the throttle. But that does mean that you get this bulk of wires underneath that are not factory and they can be really hard to diagnose and find out where they come from. So for ease of use, if they're not color coded like these ones, which is like got a yellow flash on it, just mark them up with a pen. And anyway, I usually do both. Because factory wiring is usually pretty logical. You can usually trace where it comes from. The lengths are usually correct and it sits nicely. Aftermarket stuff like a quick shifter system usually is a universal fit kind of thing and they can be a nightmare to trace and you can spend hours trying to work out where things run and which multi-plug went where. So just make sure you mark things up. So you filmed your reel and you now got to edit it all together. I used to film on the camera you're watching this on now, a fancy 4K camera, and then I'd upload it to my computer and then I'd edit it on some software on my computer. And I'll be honest with you, it took ages. And I was just doing really simple and basic cutting and shutting of clips together. So now I do everything on my iPhone. So I film, I edit, and I do the voiceover all on my iPhone. It just makes it quicker. And that's another thing that with little short form videos I've found is consistency is really important. Rather than really high quality you know, videos once a week, once a month, it's real important to put out more content regularly. And it's more of what you've got inside the video, so the actual content itself and the quality of it. So you've edited up a little video, you now need to record a little voiceover. So I do that again on my phone and I always try and set the scene in the first couple of seconds. Just tell people what they're going to view and then what's going on in the video. And then people can decide from there if they want to watch it or not. Once you've done that, then just get on with it. Get straight into it. Don't faff around, just get straight on with it. I always try and get rid of all the blank space and mumbling in my short form videos. I'm not good enough to do a speech or a voiceover in one minute. I actually do it into lots of sections 
five, 10 sec seconds at a time, and then put them together and get out all of the blank space. Nobody likes blank space on those short form videos, so just get on with it, really. See, that little pause in a short form video would not have worked. People would have switched off and got disinterested in that two or three seconds. And that's because people haven't decided to watch the video or have any connection to you. They've cut, stumbled across you almost. So you've got to realize that you've just got to get on with it. Ugh. While doing these valve clearances, rather than pulling everything directly out of the way, I'm going to move these throttle bodies twist them slightly out of the way, just so I can keep the rails and stuff connected. And I can slide that rock cover out this way. I know you can get it out to the front, but it's more effort draining the coolant system, re-bleeding the coolant system, than it is to remove all the intake and a load of plugs and looms and stuff. So I'm gonna do it this way. With this PAR valve removed, there it is. And the coil's pulled out. And then you can wiggle out the rocker cover. These can be extremely tight and close to the frame. Frames nowadays are really, really narrow. So just take your time. If anything's in the way, move it and work it out gradually. So I now pull out the plugs, turn it over to top dead center on cylinder number one, and then we'll check the clearances on that cylinder, turn it over 180 degrees on the crank then, and then check the next cylinder, continue until we get all the clearances. Now use your feeler gauges to check the gap. I've got loads of different sets. Some of them have got angles like this, so you can get them around 45 degree bends. Some of them are nice and short, I quite like these ones. And then the longer ones, you know, generic ones that everyone's got. The two main things that people do wrong to get a misreading is when they force a big shim in and then they crease or bend the actual shim itself. And then once you've got a lump in that shim, you'll get a misreading because you might not be able to get that bent section into the shim and you can cause yourself a misreading. So always check that your shims are nice and straight and haven't got a kink or a bend in them. The other one is if you actually force a too big a shim underneath a valve spring, you can compress the spring, it's a spring after all, um, and then that'll give you a misreading. There's a good idea, a rough idea, is you should be able to push them under without too much effort, but it should grip enough when you pull it out that it can kind of support its own weight, so it should have a little bit of resistance on the way out. It shouldn't be tight and shouldn't be like snatching it out, it should come out in a smooth motion, but it should, say, pinch or be able to hold up its own weight. So it's a light grasp, and that'll give you the kind of right measurement for which shim you should do. And if you try the one below, the one above, and the uh, the one that you think it is, you'll get a feel for it. This 45 degree set are perfect for this uh, exhaust camshaft. It allows me to get round the back and get a proper reading on the flat surface. If you ever use 45 degree ones, never push it past this section. It'll give you a misread, and plus you can actually bend the shim. So only use the flat section. That's just there to get access really. Getting back to the short form videos, there's a couple of bits of software you can use to edit on your phone. Obviously I think the big one everyone knows is CapCut. It gets advertised everywhere online, you can find it. It's pretty good actually. You can do loads of good things on it. Um, you can even add subtitles if that's something you wanna do. But the one I use is called VN. I'll be honest with you, it's very similar, does all the same things. Uh, really easy to vo do voiceovers and record them but I've just been using it longer, so I know my way around it, and it's nice and easy to use, plus it's free as well. So just use a nice free bit of editing software. I now need to change the valve shims on these. I think I've got four that are out of whack. So we've got uh, three on the exhaust side and one on the inlet we need to change. So I'm now gonna pull them out and see where we are. So in all, if you're gonna make some short videos, which if you've got a business or anything to promote, I definitely recommend it, it is great for it. Just don't overcomplicate it. Use a system that is nice and easy for you to use that you can just do quickly, that's important. And the most important thing to focus on is getting a message across and just getting straight to it. Don't dilly-dally around, just get on with it. So I've now got the camshaft out of the bike and I'm trying to find the right shim to replace it with to get the gap set correctly. And one thing that seems to really annoy the internet is the fact that I use a set of verniers to check the size of these shims. And here's the thing, it doesn't matter what size these shims are. All you need to know is that the difference between the one that you're replacing it with. So if you've got one uh, that is 0.05 of a mil smaller, it will increase the gap by that amount. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter if it's 1.6 mil or 1.8 mil. It's just the difference you need. And it's so much quicker to use a set of verniers than it is to use a, what's this called? I've forgotten. Uh, dial not a dial indicator. 
micrometer, that's the word I'm looking for. It's way more accurate and it will tell me the actual thickness of a shim, but I don't need to know that. I just need to know what it is in relation to the other one. So say it's you know 0.5 smaller. And the other thing is you always double check it with the feeler gauge afterwards. That is the important thing. The feeler gauge is way more accurate and real time rather than just using one of these. So I use this as a quick reference just so I can quickly go through the box and find the one I want. Anyway, let's get it back together. And that's how we get back to this point. After I set the valve clearances, we did that leakage test, found it had a cross the board drop in the compression. Turns out big carbon buildup on the seats and the valves, which is causing them to lift open, and there was your issue. So I've just cleaned it all down, assessed all the parts. I'll be honest, I did it in a bit of rush because this bike is going to Spain in a few days. So I got it done quickly, and that's where we are. I'll now get these seats redressed, I'll get it back together, re dyno checked, and we'll go from there. Well, that's the engine back together. Next thing up, put it back in the frame, get it running. I always forget just how long it takes to put an engine back into a bike, but this one's done. It's now going straight to the dyno. It's half eight in the morning and then it's on a crate and then off to Spain first thing tomorrow morning. Run sweet.